Kelly. Um, Kelly just reminded me to remember to put on our microphones for BevCam. Um, welcome everybody to our school committee of the meeting, school committee of the whole meeting. Today is Tuesday, February 14th. It's Thursday, February 14th, by the way. Um, and our first order of business will be to do the Pledge of Allegiance, which for your information, the flag is behind us outside. Okay. We can kind of see Good. through the shade. All right, so welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope here. that you enjoyed your tour through Beverly and in our school district today. And um, just to get us started, we'll do some introductions and we'll start on my left right. here with Mr. Milady. Okay. Hi, my name is John Milady. I represent Ward 4 in the school committee. Okay. And I'm Rachel Abel. I represent Ward 1 and I have a fourth and fifth grader in the system. Hi, I'm Mike Cahill. I'm the mayor and a member of the school committee. Hi, I'm Kelly Ferretti. I represent Ward 2. I have a third and a fourth grader at Cove and a seventh and eighth grader at this beautiful school. Mm -hmm. And I'm Chris Silverstein, the chair of the school committee, and I represent Ward 3, which is this area of the city that we're in tonight. Hi, I'm Paul Goodwin. I'm Ward 5 school committee. I have two sons that went through their entire school history through the Beverly schools. One's a freshman at Babson, one's a junior at UNH. My name is Lorinda Visnick. I represent Ward 6. I have uh, two graduates of the Beverly Public Schools in college right now, uh, a senior at Beverly High, and an eighth grader here in this building. Okay. Well, it's Stephanie Posca. I'm Stephanie Posca. I work for the district. I'm the business office, and I'm also the recording secretary. Okay. And I forgot to gloat about my kids, but I have two graduates. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just a reminder for everybody, though these interviews are public, members of the public are not given the opportunity tonight to ask questions. I hope you did get to the forum and have a chance to do that there. Um, there will be feedback forms available after this if you want to share some insight or thoughts with us after this final interview. And BevCam, thanks to BevCam again for taping. Um, the, BevCam is taping all of the interviews and they'll, they should be available um, on the BevCam site either tomorrow or early next week. And um, they will release them once this interview is, is finished. And so, um, Mrs. Carboni, thank you for coming and for your interest in this position and in Beverly Public Schools in general. We know that this has been a long day for you, and um, we hope that you found it as rewarding as it was informational. We've heard a lot of wonderful things about you. We've read about you from um, what you've submitted, and we've heard um, some information from our search committee or our screening committee. And we hope tonight to get to know you a little bit, to, for you to get to know us a little bit, and a little bit more about the district. However, we have a barrel of questions. We have 15 questions for you um, that each of the school committee members have submitted. And you know, the hope is that we can engage in some dialogue, but with that amount of questions, it kind of gives you about three to five minutes per question. Okay. So after question number eight. Talker, so okay. <laughs> I will try to pace myself. So on or around question number eight, I'll give us a time check, just so okay. we all have a sense of where we're at. Okay. Um, so just to start with, um, would you briefly tell us a little bit about you and what you brought to what what brought you to Beverly, mm -hmm. and then maybe share some perceptions of your day, some insights or some surprises that you might have come away <laughs> with after hanging out in Beverly today. Great. Um, well, thank you um, to members of the committee for for inviting me to be here. I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to talk with you, and was really excited to be called back. Um, as a finalist, I was um, very excited about that. So um, like you, I am also a resident of um, Beverly. I um, live here and have lived here for about 14 years now. Um, I live uh, in the Cove area, um, right across the street from um, Cove Elementary School. Uh, with my husband, Chip, um, who, who grew up in Beverly, and that's sort of the connection and why we landed back here. Um, and my daughter, Mia, um, and my, my dog, Stella. That's the, <laughs> the extent of the family. And um, so I'm also a proud um, parent of a, a graduate, a Beverly High School graduate. My daughter graduated last um, June. 
and is a freshman now um, in um, at Temple University in Philadelphia and really thriving and, and doing well. And I'm so grateful for the experience that she had in the Beverly Public Schools because I felt she was so well um, prepared, um, you know, academically, but also in terms of her um, emotional development. Um, and uh, she's very, you know, uh, grounded and has a good um, sense of herself. And I feel that she got that uh, really uh, well-rounded education here um, in Beverly Public Schools. So as a parent, I say I th thank um, the school committee and um, the schools and all the teachers um, for that because I feel um, a beneficiary of, of the school district. Um, I come here by way of Salem Public Schools. I'm the assistant superintendent um, in Salem, just over the bridge. I've been there for seven years. This is my seventh year. Uh, I oversee all aspects of teaching and learning and uh, many operational um, functions and lots of things that one would not think uh, fall under my job description, but I do have an all hands on deck kind of approach to the work. Um, so nothing feels you know, out of bounds um, to my role, but my primary responsibilities are, are teaching and learning um, and, and a variety of operational um, uh, functions. And um, prior to that, I, um, right before Salem, I was in Triton um, uh, Regional School District, my first experience in a regional district. So three communities that were uh, kind of vastly different. Salisbury, very similar kind of to, to Salem, has lots of diversity and, um, uh, a, you know, a, a very, um, diverse student demographic and um, the other two communities not so much um, but it was my first experience in a regional um, district and um, so that was interesting there I was the chief ac academic officer and again oversaw um, the the teaching and learning um, arm of the, the organization um, Prior to that, I did work at the Department of Ed for five years um, in the Office of School and District um, uh, Improvement, and I oversaw um, uh, uh, school improvement uh, projects across a variety of districts uh, in the state. Um, so I worked really all over the state um, and was there for five years. I, I really... Um, I'm grateful for that experience. I really understand how the department works and have been able to sort of work my way through the system pretty effectively on the behalf of the districts that I've worked in since because I know how, I know a lot of people there um, who still work there and I know, um, you know, how to sort of work through um, the bureaucracy, if you will, um, of the Department of Ed. And um, I have significant experience um, both as a school leader and a t teacher. Um, I, was, I have been both a principal and an assistant principal, five years as a principal, six years as an assistant principal. So I have a combined um, about 11 years as a, a school leader. So I understand um, you know, the challenges and the um, of that work. I think the principalship is, is a very complex um, position and um, I understand the pressures um, that our principals face and um, you know work very closely with principals in my current role in a coaching capacity. Um, and I also taught English um, at an alternative high school um, for a number of years um, in Providence. I did start out with a one-year stint um, at a private school and really learned that I wanted to get into the public sector. So that's sort of who I am sort of on a professional standpoint. My experience today was um, wonderful. I really appreciated the opportunity. When I first saw the list, I was like, wow, there's a day for you. <laughs> um, but it went really quickly. And um, it was great to have the opportunity to be in the schools, um, to, to um, talk to kids, to see what they were learning um, in, the, in, in cl their classrooms. Um, and, you know, I, um, had yeah a wonderful experience i found the schools to be really um bright and cheerful the classrooms clean and organized 
Um, I found kids really universally engaged in their learning. Um, and I saw a learning model that really, um, you know, put learning in the hands of kids. Um, so I saw a lot of active um, learning. I saw kids working in flexible spaces. Um, so a lot of, you know, sometimes we feel like we have to control kids because otherwise we'll lose order. And I felt that, you know, I'm not sure exactly how it happens. I'm sure it's, you know, lots of structure and teaching routines to kids. Um, but I felt a comfort in the classrooms with teachers um, allowing kids to freely move around the room, even around the school, which I, I really like. I mean, they've got to grow up and, and be responsible and be respectful of space and, and uh, you know, own their own conduct and so forth. So I really took notice of that and thought that that was really, um, you know, important. Um, I was really impressed with the level of access to technology from the early grades through the high school. I mean, I have to say, um, and you know, kudos to the school committee for the you know commitment that you've made to that. Lots of times, you know, you can have one-to-one -one initiatives, and it becomes sort of a glorified keyboard and screen, um, and there's a danger in that, right? Um, but what I saw today was kids using technology as a tool for learning um, and uh, <clears throat> kids were um, using different apps they were um, you know doing coding I saw kids do coding um, I saw kids um, you know in robotics I, at the high school I went into the piano um, the piano room and I was just like just you know I really in awe of what you've created and and um, you know provided access um, to your kids the the, the studio uh, um, at the high school um, and the uh, television studio and 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 so forth so um, that is a tremendous I think gift and um, asset um, in in the district um, so it was just a wonderful day. I really enjoyed being able to talk to lots of different stakeholders. The kids, you know, I mean, people introduced me. They didn't really know who I was. And I had a little second grader at Cove say, welcome. You know, he's just walking with his class down the hall. And he looked up at me and said, welcome to Cove. Aww. And I was just like warmed my heart. Um, so, you know, there's just a good feeling. Um, in the schools, they're clean. I, I mean, this school, I, I, I have to say I was at a loss for words, really, um, after leaving here. This is a, a really a remarkable um, uh, thing that you have accomplished here as a, as a school committee and as a community. Um, this school is, you know, not only fabulous in its, you know, freshness and its, its um, newness, but I can really feel and connect to this building being built to support a philosophy around learning. Um, and I know there were millions of decisions that were made um, to um, make that happen. But just, you know, the, I, I just genius, some of the decisions, the classrooms with the, the spaces in between, like the meeting rooms where it affords um, small group instruction. Kids can leave and 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 go in there um, and work separate from from their class if they need a quiet space to 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 learn. There's an opportunity for teachers to do push-in services there um, that I think is you know we have to take the kid out of the classroom and um, and so forth. So um, the maker spaces were amazing. Um, just the creativity, the different heights of the tables. They can write on the tables. I mean, it really is, um, it, it's like no detail was left undone. So again, I, congratulations, because I think this is just, uh, you know, I, I think in my letter I said, for, you know, driving down the street, I can see that it is impressive and really a, a flagship um, for the North Shore. And now being in here, I would even say this is a, a national sort of model um, for middle school education that goes beyond um, the community of Beverly and, and, and Massachusetts. So, um, yeah.
I probably went over. Okay. I... <laughs> you did, but th th that's okay. <laughs> it was a great introduction, so thank you. Um, and then we're going to hand it over to Mr. Milady with uh, a question. So, Mrs. Carbone, hi. Uh, hi. Congratulations on being a finalist. Thank you. Um, so this is a uh, this is a two part question. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the first part is, if you were to have a three hundred and sixty degree review, how would those you manage describe you? And the second part is, how would those that manage you describe you? Okay. Well, that's interesting. Um, so I think that um, people who um, I manage would say that um, I have vision. Um, I have vision that's grounded in a knowledge of best practice um, and is grounded in research. I'm not afraid to think big. Um, especially when faced with difficult problems, persistent problems that are hard to tack, tackle with a technical approach. Um, so um, I think vision would be a, a key piece and an innovator, um, someone who brings new ideas to the table and encourages others um, to do that. I think people who I manage would say that um, I entrust and empower them, um, that I am a team builder, um, that I'm a good listener, um, and that I share decision making 90 5% of the time, and when I need to make a tough decision, I have the courage um, to do that. Um, I think they would also say that I, in empowering them, I also um, have demonstrated ability to uh, leverage resources to support their ideas and, and work. Um, those who manage me, I think would say that um, I have a deep sense of purpose in my work, um, that I'm a person and a leader who has clear core values and lives by those core values, one being that students are at the center of all my decision making, um, and that I have a fierce sensibility around equity and access, and belief that all children deserve an excellent education. Um, and I think they would say I'm hardworking, um, that I can bring a lightness to the work. I like to laugh and have a good time. And I think that's important. Um, and that I'm keen on celebrating successes because that's what motivates people to continue to work hard and smart. Okay, thank you. Um, Mrs. Visnick. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Ms. Garoni, what have you done in your current role to address the growing social, emotional, and behavioral needs of all students. And if you could describe um, in those activities that you've done, which of them have been successful and which have posed additional challenges? Mm -hmm. Well, um, sort of on a high level, I would say um, probably the most significant thing that I've done to address social emotional needs and you may not at first pass think that this is like directly connected to that but um, I have um, led improvements in core instruction so um, m my goal is that daily instruction is um, really high quality 
um, is accessible to all learners. We know when kids aren't engaged or they don't feel a sense of belonging or purpose in the classroom, that's when they disengage and become dysregulated. And we have, you know, a variety of issues. So um, I always, you know, see that has been a priority around building uh, really strong practices for daily core instruction. Um, um, I also have um, built um, systems, again, with, you know, um, colleagues um, at my side, um, systems to support tiered instruction, um, because even with a quality um, daily uh, dose of instruction, some kids are still going to continue to struggle and need more, and they may need um, academic supports, and they may need behavioral supports. Um, so having um, systems in place where we have good data so that we can identify who those kids are, um, and we're not waiting um, you know, till the end of the year, um, but that we have benchmark moments where um, we're able to identify kids who may need more, and then be at the ready um, with those um, systems and, and structures. Um, so, um, you know, we have a variety of um, academic interventions um, to re-engage kids and to support their learning, um, as well as um, behavioral um, uh, supports and interventions as well. Um, with regard to, like, specifically social-emotional learning, um, you know, we're at the point um, in Salem where we have um, piloted um, different curricula at different levels. Um, we were we received a grant that allowed us to purchase um, uh, different um, curricula, and um, so and, and teachers have been implementing that um, in different places in the district. And we're at the point where we need to step back and do a review of that, and then sort of, you know put our stake in the sand around. Um, you know, which curricula, um, you know, we're, we're going to employ. My preference is to have one that is, um, you know, is not a standalone, something that we do aside from core curriculum. You know, uh, the ideal is that it's very teacher friendly and doesn't create another prep um, for teachers um, and is something that can be, um, you know, the skills taught within the at core academic program and reinforced during learning um, because I, I think that's the ideal um, scenario. Okay, a very quick follow up question. Sure. Is any of that curriculum <clears throat> trauma based or trauma informed? Um, I think all of it is, um, you know, that, um, uh, yes, caring schools at their early grades, I know is one that we were using in the, the early grades. Um, so I think it is, I can't say for sure though, to be honest. Thank you. Okay, uh, next question is from Mayor Cahill. Thank you, Madam President. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Carboni, uh, given the cyclical nature of the economy, it is entirely possible that a more difficult economic time may come to pass mm -hmm. during our next superintendent's tenure. Mm -hmm. Please explain how you would help guide the Beverly Public School District through such a time. Yeah, so I think, you know, any good budgeting strategy is grounded in priorities. Uh, so I think the district has to be really, really clear on its priorities. And I think, you know, Beverly right now has a really strong district improvement plan, a strategic plan um, in place. I know that, that I think it goes through 2021. Um, so for, for the next few years, so being really grounded in those priorities and how those manifest themselves in the work um, uh, and really have to prioritize the priorities too, even um, because sometimes that can be, um, can be a lot. I think it's super important to engage principals in the budgeting process so that they understand what the landscape is um, and, you know, um, and to ask principals what they need, you know, what, what are their um, priorities at their school um, and what they need to, to, to meet those um, priorities. I'm always um, 
in my own work seeking efficiencies. Um, I'm not a big proponent of adding things on top of, you know, you just kind of create this stack of things. And sometimes as priorities shift, you can stop doing one thing to bring on a new thing. And um, I think it's being really careful to understand, um, you know, what, what those those things are that are sort of phasing out. They were really important to lay a foundation for the work, but they're no longer needed um, as we move into a new phase of work. Um, so I think, you know, that's, um, you know, super, super important. I think it's important to um, work with, I, I don't really know your process, but I would imagine um, there's a finance subcommittee um, and that the superintendent is working with that finance subcommittee in between bringing something to the whole committee. Um, and really working um, with the committee to bring forward the recommendations and the needs um, from the schools um, and to school committee and working together um, to, to prioritize um, and, um, and move a fiscally responsible budget forward um, that doesn't, you know, that's fiscally responsible and, and attends to um, the district priorities and helps to maintain, um, you know, uh, uh, momentum forward. Okay, I have the next question. Um, special education is a challenge because of the complexity of rules, the special needs of the students and the parent concerns. When you assess the effectiveness of a special education program, what are you looking for? Well, I'm um, first and foremost looking for kids to be educated in the least restrictive environment. Um, so we want kids, you know, as much as possible learning in um, the general ed classroom. Um, and so that is, uh, you know, a key piece. Um, again, I'll go back to, you know, I'd be looking for in the general ed classroom, even though it's not special education, a lot of students on IEPs are in the general ed classroom, and I'm looking for, um, you know, access points for kids um, that allow them entry into um, the learning. So things like, you know, a student might need a word bank, they might need sentence starters, they might need a modified text. They might need a graphic organizer. Um, they might need some assistive technology. Um, so those kinds of things that are allowing kids to be successful um, in learning in the general ed classroom. Um, I heard a little bit today about um, the co-teaching model and um, I, like the concept of the co-teaching model. Um, I have seen it be successful and it also be unsuccessful. Um, and I think one of the real pivotal things um, is that the teachers need time to plan. Um, otherwise, what you have is the general ed classroom teacher, most likely, and then the special educator not really knowing what to do because they're not really sure what the teacher is, is teaching because they haven't had that time to plan. Right. Um, so in order to really leverage the expertise of both those educators, it's super important to to have um, planning uh, time um, for them to co-plan and really f negotiate who's doing what and what are the supports being provided um, by by the special educator. So I think the co-teaching model is, um, you know, a, a great um, way to go. Um, but needs to be um, supported um, and resourced. Um, I also think, you know, um, I heard a lot today from talking to principals and, and other district leaders around um, building programs in the district. Um, and so for students who do have um, highly specialized needs, uh, rather than sending them out of district, it's much better to create um, programs um, internally. So I know you have an autism um, program. 
um, the therapeutic support uh, program, language-based programs. Um, and, you know, I would be looking <clears throat> that those, that there's really specialized instruction happening in those classrooms to meet those specific learning needs of, of, of those children. Um, but if you do that well, your districts that do do that well save themselves out of district tuition and also really, um, you know, uh, high uh, transportation costs um, that I think, you know, feeds into the question around budget. Um, if we can reduce those things, meet the kids' needs in house, then we have those resources to do. Um, you know, other things for, for all kids um, in the district. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Abel. Thank you. Ms. Carbone, how would you develop a strategy of improvement for the district and ensure that it addresses the priorities of the district? And if possible, could you give us an example of a framework or a strategy that you've employed to support this effort? So, need maybe a little sure. clarifying um so like um developing an improvement plan for the district yes Is an improvement plan to a program or you, you can take it how you'd like um to give an example of, of how you've seen to make improvements that support priorities okay um well, I can kind of think macro and micro on that so I'm thinking like large scale I mean if this were you know um to you know say it comes to the time when your district improvement plan is needs to be reviewed and um and um uh updated and and renewed um i would seek to employ a community engaged process um that would bring stakeholders from across roles and domains um into the process so you know, I'm sure that your um, district improvement plan was not built by Dr. Hershey by himself in his office. And, um, you know, I would not seek to do that either. Um, so, as I said, a community engaged process that would start with um, thinking about what we want our kids, what, what we want the graduate to look like um and um if that's what we want our graduates to look like and be uh, equipped with um certain skills and <clears throat> habits and um abilities then um you know what are the 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 programs the priorities um the work that we need to undertake to to make that happen I like to do an asset based approach to that as well. Um, you know, you can't neglect the good work that is underway. So a review of what's working um, and building off of that. Right. Um, I, you know, building off of, um, you know, solid practice and and programs that are getting results. Um, I think is is really important. I'm not afraid to make mid course corrections in that process. Um, if if things aren't aren't working, that's okay. Um, we have to have the courage to to say that and and move on to to a better place. So at the big level, I would say you know a community engaged process um, that is anchored in a vision of what we want kids um, to 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 know and be able to do and um, and then aligning um, things to that. I, I also think it's really important. Sometimes when we develop district improvement plans, we get the plan approved and then we go, <sighs> right? Um, because there's a lot of effort, and meetings and, and so forth um, in that process. I think it's super important to create a set of metrics that help you measure your progress toward a achieving the goals stated in the improvement plan. So um, I think that's a really important phase that sometimes gets um, overlooked. Um, so a, a dashboard of sorts that would, you know, give school committee and members of the community, parents um, and, and the superintendent a, a way to sort of look and say, these are the measures that, you know, indicate the health of, um, and the 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 
um, uh, the, goal, the um, progress that we're making toward achieving goals. Um, and, you know, we're either on track or we're off track, um, or we're ahead of, of, of the game. Um, so I think um, that would be um, an important uh, process. Um, I've done lots of reviews of programs um, that aren't, you know, aren't big, you know, like a district improvement plan kind of thing, but um, stepping back and doing um, a review of a curriculum program. Um, and, um, you know, we've done that in a variety of different ways. We've um, reviewed our assessment, um, uh, our assessment plan and framework um, and made shifts on that. Um, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, so we were in um, the first few years that I was in Salem, we were partnering with an organization called Achievement Network and they offer um, assessments and that was really important for us to have. We needed some benchmarks around student achievement early on. So we partnered with them. They work with many districts in Massachusetts and across the country. Um, and about three years into working with them, we kind of outgrew um, the, their assessments. They were no longer really nicely aligned to our curriculum. Um, so what I did was we convened um, uh, about 25 teachers and school leaders and coaches um, and we put an RFP out and we had four different responses um, to the RFP. We created a, fr a framework where um, the teachers could review, um, you know, and we even before that we said what we want in our new assessment system are these things these flexibilities that we don't currently have, um, created a review sheet for, for teachers, um, and had the, um, the vendors come in and present um, those, um, their tools, and we made an informed decision, and it was you know based on that group of 25. Some of them we sent to districts that were using these um, resources for them to actually see it in, in progress so that they could bring that um, experience back. Great, thank you. Okay, next we have Mr. Goodwin. Thank you. So as superintendent, how would you work to recruit and retain excellent educators to the Beverly Public Schools? Mm -hmm. So that's a, a good question and a, a really important one because I feel like teacher quality is, you know, I mean, all the research points to teacher quality being, um, you know, the has the single largest impact on student achievement. Um, so we definitely want to have a pipeline as teachers retire or move out of town. And, um, you know, we have vacancies that we have a pipeline that we can fill with um, really highly qualified candidates. We were talking a little earlier in the, the parent forum around wanting to recruit um, more diverse candidates um, as well which I think is, is super important. Um, so on the recruitment side, <clears throat> I think it's, you know, it's important to build relationships um, with the local universities um, and, um, you know, not just in the local area, but as far as Boston and, and throughout the state um, and um, build those relationships um, and, um, you know, in, invite folks. I saw lots of um, student teachers in the classrooms today when I was visiting, and they were from all different, um, you know, colleges and universities, which was really, you know, excellent to see. Um, so I think it's important to to build those relationships, um, strong relationships. Work with the HR department to be a partner um, in creating a strategy. You have to have a strategy for um, being really thoughtful um, about. Uh, recruiting. Um, I think the retention piece is is super important. I've done a lot of work around um, supporting um, new teachers in our district. Um, so I've worked with um, we we wrote a grant to Nellie May, the Nellie May Foundation, and we were awarded one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars to support really rethinking our strategy around new teacher. Um, and really, new teacher is not just teachers teachers who are new to the profession, but anyone who is new to Salem. 
um, and may have taught somewhere else, but we really wanted to onboard them really thoughtfully to our, our practices and, and the way we work in Salem, because I think that's a retention strategy, right? The more we nurture people on their entry, um, the better they sort of settle in. Um, so we were able to, um, you know, usually our, our new teacher was kind of a like a half day, one day thing. Um, and so we expanded that to four days. Um, we paid teachers to be here. It was important enough for us to want them to be here. Um, so we paid them through um, through the grant. Um, and, you know, we'll have to find a way to sustain that um, going forward. Um, and um, and uh, paid them to be here four days um, and really the focus of those four days was on you know orienting them to the curriculum um, but more importantly um, sharing some common practices around creating welcoming learning environments that's often where new teachers really struggle right they get in they can't manage the classroom and it, it just kind of goes from there um, so we worked really hard with them around um, what does it mean to create a welcoming learning environment in your classroom and we taught them strategies and then we had them practice it and we gave them feedback and we had them do it again and practice it so we wanted to give them at bats before they actually got on to the into the real game um, and so um, it, and it built a lot of confidence um, for new teachers. So we, we did the summer four day. We also make sure all our new teachers have, um, you know, a mentor. And then we network them um, throughout the course of the year to bring them together. We run focus groups. Um, we did um, surveys. I've visited all the new teacher classrooms at least once um, to check in on them, to let them know we're paying attention and we care about them. Um, so I think that goes a long way um, around retention. I will just mention one thing that came up a lot in terms of my conversations with folks today um, around teacher, stra um, teacher salaries um, and that being an issue around teacher retention in some ways. So I think that's something for, um, you know, to, to be discussed um, and, and thought about because that too can play into, um, into retention. All right. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Mrs. Ferretti. Hello. Uh, my question is in a, a bit of a different direction. Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, what is the best mistake that you've ever made? Mm -hmm. and, and by that, I mean a, a decision that you, you made that did not turn out as you thought and you, how you dealt with that to turn it into a, a positive outcome. Yeah. <laughs> well, my my That's example. That's the curveball last time with the, if money it was no option. When is yeah. money no option? I was like, wow, I never thought about that. So but. my example of this, like my best mistake, is we we bought a gas grill and I my husband got halfway through assembling it and uh, and screamed, "This isn't propane! It's natural gas!" And we didn't have it hooked up for that. But as we took a step back and realized, well, we could run gas and. Lo and behold, I, to this day, have a, a natural gas grill. <laughs> so that is just something that, to give an idea of that. mistake. We all make them. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've made a lot of mistakes, yeah. but most of them aren't my best ones. Yeah. So, oh. so, um, okay. I mean, I, my best mistake. I guess, um, you know, sometimes you interview folks for a position and you might have reservations. You know, I, I, I had a, a superintendent that I worked for and she said, you know, your, your hires are like clothes. They either look good on you or they don't. Um, and so, you know, hiring staff is a really important, um, important um, task and responsibility of leadership uh, that I take very seriously. And, um, you know, there have been times when I have, you know, second guessed and I said, uh, you know, I'm not 
sure if this person is, you know, going to be um, a, a good fit for us and have brought the person in for, you know, second and third interview. Um, and I, I guess I don't know if this actually sort of fits what, what you're talking about, but, um, you know, took a chance, even though in my heart I was maybe a little skeptical um, and, um, you know, uh, things turned out to work well and, um, you know, um, folks were able to integrate into the team and be contributing members of the team. I don't know. Is that sort yeah, of it's in the realm? Whatever of, comes yeah, to mind. That's what comes but, to mind. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are at a time checkpoint, and it's 8 o'clock, 8.01, and we're cruising right along, and it looks like we'll be able to continue on with all of our questions. So okay, Mr. Great. Milady is going to start us again. All right. Hello again. Hello. So currently, <clears throat> currently Beverly does not have a free full-day kindergarten program. So what is, what is your personal opinion on community, communities providing this service to its residents? And then the follow-up question, is this something that you would pursue? Well, I'm a, I'm a strong advocate for, um, for kindergarten. Um, so it would, um, you know, I, I, again, I, I would have to survey and and see what the community interest is um you know what are um <clears throat> um what's the demand for i mean you don't want to start something that there's no demand for um so you know what is the demand for it in the community is it is it something where we you know could fill the seats um you know i do think you know kindergarten plays a really important role um in getting kids ready for school um, it's an important, um, you know, foundation and transition. My experience has been that, you know, kids who do go to kindergarten sort of have a, a readiness to sort of socialize to the, um, to the way a classroom works um, and have really, you know, really good, strong foundational skills, um, you know. Um, but I know that there are parents, too, who... Um, you know, prefer to keep kids home um, at that. So I, I think, you know, my first step would be to really understand um, the demand in the community and um, uh, uh, then look, see what the, you know, if where we could accommodate that in the, in the district. Um, would it mean we would, you know, need, uh, can, can the schools grow that? I know. Um, you know, there, the space is an issue. That's certainly not a reason not to, to bring it in because that's a technical thing that can um, be, <clears throat> you know, rethought. Um, but, um, you know, and, uh, you know, see, seeking grants. There used to be kindergarten grants at the state level. Had not so much um, anymore, but um, trying to figure out how to, to resource um, full-day kindergarten, universal. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, Mrs. Visnick. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> Mrs. Carboni, my question is around what I feel is our most pressing need <clears throat> of our children here in Beverly, the achievement gap. Mm -hmm. As I hope you're aware, our gap is based on socioeconomic status versus race. I've made this topic a personal priority Last summer, I took time off work to attend an accelerated week-long course at Harvard on the topic of closing the achievement gap. Mm -hmm. Over the course of the week, I listened to educators and administrators from around the world talk about the issues and possible solutions. My question for you is based on this topic, rooted in my personal pursuit of what I consider to be a form of social justice. Mm -hmm. What best practices have you implemented and would you implement, or in the case of having no such experiences, what best practices are you aware of that can be replicated here in Beverly in order to address our achievement gap? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I hate to keep going back to my old mainstay, but I, I do feel um, the achievement gap is perpetuated um, by um, sometimes expectations that vary um, 
we have different expectations for different kids. We um, make assumptions um, about what they bring to school um, with them. And so I, I think, you know, the first thing is around mindset um, and some work around cultural proficiency and, um, you know, um, and, and so forth. Um, so I think, you know, that's one piece. Um, is really making sure that we have high expectations for all kids um, and we don't um, scale down the curriculum for a certain population of students because we feel for whatever reason they're not able or capable. Um, so high expectations for all and again a thoughtful um, approach to making sure that our um, academic program is accessible um, to, to all kids. Again, you know, um, creating access points and, and differentiation as a matter of course. Um, it's, you know, those kinds of strategies are good for all kids, but they're an imperative for kids who are, are behind. Um, so, I think um, that that's one place um, for sure, you know, a tiered instructional model um, that has, um, you know, as I said before, good measures for identifying which kids are behind and then research based scientifically um, oriented um, interventions that target kids needs. Um, it's great when they can be adaptive um, and online. Um, and can serve, um, you know, to um, support and, and, and um, uh, fill in gaps that students have in learning. What I don't, would not want to see is kids pulled out of core instruction to receive those interventions because then we're just perpetuating the problem, right? We're taking them out of the classroom to ramp them up, but they're missing core instruction. Um, so there's got to be a model where um, students are getting um, you know, uh, their ramp up, their, um, their interventions or extensions, um, you know, at a time that is not interfering with, with core instruction. I think we have to think really creatively around the school year um, for kids. So we've done a lot of vacation academies. We make them fun. Um, you know, we have storytellers, we have dance, we have, and then we also have academics. Um, all data driven around where kids' gaps in learning are and targeted toward, um, you know, um, uh, closing um, that gap. I think the summer also is another um, place that, you know, a time that we need to leverage. Um, and again, it can't be all, you know, um, all work and no fun, right? So uh, a, a program, a summer program that mixes academics but also enrichment activities um, and creates a sense of fun and exposure to, to opportunities in the sun, summer that the children may not have um, otherwise. Because I think there's, um, you know, an achievement gap, but there's also an opportunity gap um, also that often co coincides um, with, with the achievement cap. Um, so I think, you know, leveraging um, after school time, um, vacation academies, um, summer, summertime, um, and, and leveraging in school um, time for support and interventions. Thank you. You're welcome. Mayor Cahill. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> Mrs. Carboni, given the opportunity to lead the Beverly Public Schools, how would you ensure consistency of instruction throughout the district, said another way, instruction that reliably and effectively delivers the district's curriculum? Um, great. Um, so I, I would approach this um, in partnership um, with school leaders. Um, and I think it's really important to get clarity and some shared understandings um, across leadership around what consistency, um, what quality instruction looks like. 
that is aligned to district priorities. So let's define that. Let's have a shared understanding of what that is. I'm a, a big proponent of putting chart paper up on the walls. I love whiteboards. I get two big ones in my office and lots of colored markers. And I draw pictures and I lots of arrows and circles and what have you and encourage uh, hand the pen off to others to to do the same so i think the first thing is to get really um uh clear on what quality instruction looks like well, how do we define that in in beverly um and and to do that as i said in partnership with with school leadership um, and then to test that out on school committee members um with teachers of course um, so that there is a real clear understanding. What I don't like to do is monitor instruction and people not really know what you're looking for and then it feels like an I gotcha. So we don't wanna do that. So we wanna be really clear and transparent about what our definition of quality instruction is um, and to, to actually commit that to paper um, so people, people know that. Um, and then I think, you know, my approach to um, overseeing, monitoring, supporting instruction is multifaceted. So I think being in classrooms, there's no better way um, to, to, um, to, to get a sense of, of what is happening. So um, I, I think I've told you before, I spend a significant amount of time um, in my current position and in all of my positions as a principal, I was in classrooms all the time. Um, so I would seek to be in classrooms with principals, with teachers. Um, we do instructional rounds um, in the Salem Public Schools. You know, to start, that was a little unnerving because it was a new practice. It made teachers a little nervous. Um, and so we had to communicate really clearly what this was and what it wasn't these are not evaluative right we have an evaluation process for that um, this is so we can we can stay in touch with with teaching and learning so we can better understand what is in classrooms we want to partner with you on that we've evolved to a place where we are doing instructional rounds now with teacher teams um, so I was at a school the other day and we had three teams we we had a big team but we broke up into three little groups and we all went off and visited um, five classrooms so the team saw 15 classrooms came back and then sort of shared um, you know what was seen across classrooms we don't talk about individual teachers or individual classrooms but it's like broad strokes what did we see based on what we were looking for and we go in with a very clear lens that is familiar to teachers um, and shared very, you know, explicitly. Um, and the goal is to provide headlines, like what we're, you know, we wanna give again to, to that um, idea of celebrating successes. Like, gosh, we just started implementing this and look already what you're, you're accomplishing. And so naming what those things are and then um, also setting one tangible, not a laundry list, not 15 things, no one can implement 15 things, but what's one actionable bite-sized piece of feedback that the team can agree to, that the principal can sink their teeth into and, and leverage um, at the school level. I'm a believer in incremental growth um, over time. You don't, you know, I mean, sometimes I guess we take big leaps, but it's usually, um, you know, small, deliberate, thoughtful steps forward that um, create, um, you know, a momentum toward, um, toward goals. Um, I also think you can monitor um, sort of consistency of instruction through data. Um, so I know that you have common assessments. Um, so what do those look like? <clears throat> and what are the data points that give us insight into student learning? Um, and, you know, I think you have to triangulate sort of your observations of, of instruction and then the actual output, what are, what are kids able to do, what does writing look like in, across the grade levels, um, what does, um, you know, how, how are kids, um, you know, uh, meeting reading benchmarks across the year, that's super important, right, because that reading um, is something that can impact all class um, achievement in all classes. 
Um, so I would want to have a really good sense of um, student performance data throughout the course of the year on benchmarks um, in conjunction with, with observation data. Um, we did, we're doing something really interesting right now um, in Salem. We did a, a teacher survey, so we're working with Johns Hopkins University, um, and they're really interested in this idea of um, uh, curriculum implementation. And um, one thing they do is a teacher survey. Um, so, you know, to, uh, to get teachers um, perceptions around the ease of the curriculum I do the, is you know to on a scale a lot of Likert scale um, responses um, you know on average how often do you use the district curriculum how often do you supplement with outside um, you know resources and so forth so they have this real um, you know carefully um, research-based survey for teachers that along with observations can produce some really um, good information for a district to, to make some decisions um, around um, you know, the consistency of use of the curriculum um, to support instruction. We haven't gotten, the teachers just took the survey um, uh, two weeks ago and we haven't gotten the results yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Yeah. It's my turn again. Okay. Um, what are the important aspects or characteristics of a successful relationship between the superintendent and the school committee? Mm -hmm. And how do you plan to keep the school committee informed? I was going to ask you guys that, <laughs> um, so I, if I get the chance, I will. Um, so I think you know um, it's really important um, that um, there be transparency. I think that's really key. Um, not to hold things back, to have good communication, courage to to share, um, you know, things good, bad, and and in between. And I think that that goes, um, you know both directions um, so a, a good open lines of communication um, and um, uh, and transparency and honesty uh, I think are, are key um, I think it's important for um, the school the school superintendent to understand what the school committee what kinds of information they feel is really important for them to play, um, to be effective um, members of the governance body that you are um, as a school committee. Um, so are there regular reports that you're looking for? Um, are there, um, you know, presentations that, you know, um, there may be things that you're looking for regularly and then other things that are of interest um, and um, that I think is important um, for school committee members um, you know to share and, and for the superintendent to respond I think you know ideally there would be sort of an understanding of no surprises I don't think you want to be surprised by anything, and I don't think the superintendent wants to either. Mm -hmm. No one wants to be embarrassed or feel like they're sort of caught, you know, on camera in a in a difficult situation. And that that may happen, um, but the degree to which you know um, we can keep each other informed and no surprises, um, you know, um, I think is really important. Um, my, I've built a relationship with the teams that I work with. They, you know, we've gotten to a place where they know the kinds of things they need to bring to me. Um, and we've just sort of built that relationship. So I would seek to build that relationship with you all. I need to understand what you need from me and I would do my very best to deliver on that. Um, so, uh, I think the superintendent, you know, really, um, is, is, in a lot of ways, the gatekeeper to information um, to the school committee. And so um, I think it would be really important to be clear around, um, you know, what kinds of um, information you need. I don't know if there are structures. I, I've seen it done in different districts that I've worked in. Um, in one district, the school committee chair and the 
um, superintendent met regularly. Um, I don't know if that's a structure here. It seemed to be an effective um, model that I think may be interesting to, to, to consider because I think that that um, you know, is important and there are other, I know you have to be careful about quorum, but there are times when there are tricky situations that we've met like two by two mm -hmm. um, and done two by two um, uh, meetings with members of the school committee to, to make sure that um, folks are getting the information. I think, you know, with regard to, you know, things are gonna happen in the schools, right? And it's, again, no surprises. Uh, you know, it would be my intent to make sure that that was, anything like that is communicated immediately um, to school committee so that you don't hear it um, from a concerned parent first, um, but rather from the, from the stup superintendent. Great, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Abel. I double hit it, sorry. <laughs> Ms. Carvone, as superintendent, what steps would you take to get to know the community and become an approachable, engaging, and visible education, educational leader in our city? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the first thing um, I would do is to, um, you know, upon, you know, if I were to be the next superintendent upon appointment is to really give um, some careful thought in constructing um, an entry plan um, that would um, <clears throat> have as a major component um, uh, meeting with a variety of different stakeholders um, to start. So um, meeting with parents in, in small focus groups, meeting with school committee members, meeting with students, meeting with community partners, meeting with members of the business community um, in, in the district. Um, really getting out there, um, introducing myself, um, and using that introduction as an opportunity to learn um, about um, what people, um, what about the Beverly schools excite people and where the opportunities um, exist um, for, for moving the district forward. Um, so, and, and I would use, um, you know, those opportunities um, to, um, you know, construct sort of the, a, a plan for my first year beyond um, that initial um, three months probably it would take to really do a good job um, with that. So I would see that as a first step um, toward, you know, um, I think we were talking earlier about going to Rotary and, and you know, different, um, different um, uh, venues, meeting with PTOs um, and, and so forth. Um, beyond that, I think, you know, and this has just been a matter of my practice um, that I'm invested in the community where I work. So I work long hours for sure um, and do what I need to do professionally. Um, but beyond that, I attend the volleyball game, I go to the school play, um, I um, you know, go to um, National Honor Society award night, um, and I go to the fourth grade all city band production. I go to art exhibits done and, and curated by our students. On Saturdays, I take my daughter with me sometimes. Sometimes I go alone. Um, so I enjoy um, celebrating and engaging in um, activities that our students are um, you know, doing, whether it be competitive or some demonstration of their artistic or musical, um, you know, abilities. Um, I think, you know, there are, um, so beyond that, you know, seeking opportunities to be visible um, in the community and in other ways, um, I think is important um, as well. Um, community functions that, um, you know, um, may be important, um, you know, uh, to s sort of round out um, the, the experience with the kids. Um, I do think that that's uh, super important 
um, uh, responsibility of, of the superintendent. I think there are other ways that we can in the 21st century be accessible um, and visible in a sense, um, you know, having a tr Twitter presence um, and, um, you know, uh, communicating, taking note of things, um, celebrating and so forth, um, different things that are happening um, in and across the schools um, in that way as well. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Goodwin. Thank you. Um, in your opinion, what is the most effective way to use technology in a school district like Beverly? With students? Yeah, across this district, whether it's uh, teaching staff, students. <coughs> yes. yeah. Well, <clears throat> I think I, you know, touched on this a little bit earlier that I think there's a danger to, uh, especially with computers that, as I said, you know, to be cliche, but, um, you know, uh, it can be uh, just sort of a glorified, you know, keyboard and a screen. So I think there needs to be, I, I think the idea and the goal should be to leverage technology to inform learning. Um, and that um, kids are using their computers to, um, to store data, to format, format data, to use software to run analytics on data, um, to inform, you know, for example, a, a chemistry experiment, um, and um, that you know, kids are using different apps in the early grades to create um, and to revise um, their work, um, and so it's uh, you know really both software and hardware, um, and um, giving kids access um, to tools, training them how to use it and integrating it within the learning experience so that they need that tool to do the work that they're do, you know, that they're, um, being asked to do. So I think there's a certain amount of, um, professional development and support that teachers need to become comfortable and proficient in doing that. Some teachers are just, they're there and that's their jam and they're gonna run with it and they can teach other teachers. Um, and then others are more hesitant um, and, um, you know, uh, timid around um, technology. So we have a responsibility to support um, teachers all along that continuum. Um, so um, I think that most ideal professional development in this case is job embedded professional development where they're sort of learning in the classroom um, and being supported um, by a, a, a coach that, you know, can facilitate um, growth in their practice in this particular way. Um, and I think a lot of it happens around the planning because you might know how to use a, an app but that in and of itself isn't going to mean that that's integrated into, um, into uh, the learning. So I, I am a real strong advocate for common planning time, um, for teachers to have time to collaborate and work. Um, I know when I see a great lesson, it didn't happen by accident that that teacher spent a lot of time um, planning that that lesson. Um, I've been a teacher, I know how hard it is. And, you know, uh, many of our teachers are teaching multiple content areas or multiple courses. Um, so that's a, a huge undertaking. So the degree to which we can support common planning time during the day is, is really important and resource that common planning time with coaches that can help elevate the practice. Um, and in this particular case, in terms of, um, you know, technology, where in the lesson is the right place to leverage technology to really support creativity, um, collaboration, problem solving? Um, and is it that I'm using the technology? Is it that the kids are using the technology? Is it a combination of both? Um, as I said in my opening remarks, you have an amazing amount of technology in 
um, the district um, and you want to make, you want to get a good return on your investment. And so I, I think, you know, supporting teachers and, and having an eye toward the professional development is really, really important. Um, I could see it alive and well in, in a lot of classrooms, um, but I'm sure there are plenty of places where, you know, it's, it's a growth point for, for teachers. So I think that professional development is, is key. Thank you, and that last part of your answer was a nice segue to the second part of my question where I'm gonna turn it around a little bit. And uh, often parents worry about too much screen time. Mm -hmm. So explain what you would tell a parent about the use of technology in the schools and how to balance that in a child's life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, you know, um, I, I hear that. And my daughter was, you know, she had her um, nice laptop from Beverly High School and wasn't always using it for, um, you know, learning purposes at home. Um, so I think, you know, there's some education and work to do. I mean, parents have to monitor what, what kids are, are doing at home as well in terms of accessing um, technology. Um, but I would say, you know, um, the kids, you know, have access to computers, um, but they're not, you know, uh, I, I think there has to be balance in terms, it's like anything, right? Too much of a good thing is no good. Um, so I do think it, there's some caution to, to be had and there should, you know, we should have an eye toward making sure there is a good balance. Um, I mean, I saw nothing today that gave me pause. Now, I didn't sit in the classrooms for whole periods, but there was, you know, <clears throat> a, a good, I think, level of balance where, you know, teacher was using some technology to set up the lesson. Kids broke down into small groups. Um, some kids, you know, were working. It depended what center they were in. Some centers were not technology-based, and some were. Um, and, you know, they rotated, um, rotated through. So, um, you know, this is the challenge of living in the 21st century, right? Um, to not have it is not a good thing. We do a disservice to our kids. They're living in this uh, world where technology is, I don't know of a job where technology isn't, um, you know, part of the skill set you have to have to be successful. Um, in that role. So um, for sure we want to monitor, um, you know, screen time and um, I, I think that, you know, purposeful screen time is different from non-focused screen time. Um, and so reassuring parents that kids are not sort of surfing and, you know, watching YouTube videos that aren't of a instructional, uh, don't have instructional value or purpose. Um, and that, um, you know, we haven't complete, you know, the instructional model, maybe, maybe getting clear around what the instructional model is here and really articulating that. And I, I'm big around writing things down and in communicate, communicating them in sort of a, you know, ideally a one pager, sometimes it may be too complex of a topic and you need more than one page, but what is the instructional model? Have we communicated that um, to parents? And where does um, technology fit into that instructional model? I think that can be reassuring to parents that, okay, I get it, I see sort of where it fits in when kids are and are not using technology um, to support their learning. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Ferretti. All right, thank you. You could pause to take a breath. We're winding down. Okay. <laughs> uh, so how would you assess uh, administrative staff that reports to you, and what would your expectation be for assessment of staff beyond that? And then the part two to that would be, uh, how would you deal with a, a staff member that isn't meeting the standards that you've yeah. set for them to to achieve? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the first part of your say the first part so of your question. So assessing um, administrative staff that reports to you and the expectation of how they would assess staff beyond that. 
So, um, so I evaluate um, a number of um, district leaders as well as the principals. Um, and um, so, you know, I think the first step is to get really clear on what their goals are for the year um, and set really clear measurable goals um, for their professional practice as well as for student learning and make sure that those are things that we can actually quantify, you know, and, and have, um, you know, data to, to support. Um, I think it's really important to do um, frequent, short um, pieces of feedback, written feedback. Um, and I think that's one part of it. I mean, that's in, within the formal evaluation process. Um, you know, that's what's required to, to write down our feedback. Um, so, um, you know, doing that in, in short, um, you know, uh, clear ways that are related to their goals and related to the district goals. Um, and also um, making sure that um, the feedback is constructive and, you know, I, I often um, get concerned when I see feedback that's, you know, like smiley faces and, you know, uh, good job and then that's it. Um, I subscribe to an ongoing continuous improvement model um, for myself as well as, as for those who I evaluate. So even a proficient and high performing staff member, and I have a lot of them, we're always pushing to the next level of practice um, and challenging them. And they appreciate that um, and providing them the supports to do that. So, um, you know, being clear on the goals, um, writing feedback that is actionable. Um, again, like I said, around the instructional rounds, you, you go and do a, an observation. You won't, I don't want a laundry list of, of next steps, something that is bite size that is actionable, that you can expect them to implement within the next two to four weeks um, is ideal. And then building on top of, you know, I often think evaluators make mistakes. They One day they're looking for this, the next day they're looking for that, the third time they're looking for this, and it's just incoherent. Um, so being really careful to, to build upon, you know, um, pieces um, of feedback to always accentuate the positive. I never write a piece of feedback without um, hi hi giving highlights um, in terms of what was you know, seen that was really positive and, and good. Um, so I think that you know, um, helps create um, you know, a sense of, uh, builds a relationship between you and, and the staff member and also um, you know, this is hard work. We want to continually give people positive feedback, um, but also push folks to the next level of practice. Um, so, you know, I have had the occasion to work with folks who are who are underperforming, um, and so um, you know, I approach those instances in the same way, um, and you know, do regular feedback, um, have clear goals, um, and. I think you know we often do a disservice uh, to people who are underperforming. We don't quite tell them that they're underperforming. We kind of couch it in code language, um, and they're not really sure. Um, and I think that's unfair um, and a disservice to that professional. So I think it's really important to be transparent, professional, caring, but transparent. Um, I feel our evaluators, we are the gatekeepers to ex excellence for kids. And there's just n no negotiating um, that we need the best, the brightest, and the most capable people um, leading our schools and in our classrooms. Um, so if there is you know, an instance of underperformance, I think it's really important to make it clear what the concern is both verbally and in writing. I don't like to write feedback and not do give 
verbal feedback because I almost feel the verbal feedback is more important, um, but our system demands that we write it as well. Um, but in most instances, I, I, I prefer to do both. Um, but for sure, in an instance where there's underperformance, it has to be followed up with a face-to-face -face feedback immediately, within two days of, of the, the observation. Um, so that is sort of my stance on um, that. Um, I monitor um, principal feedback and their work in the evaluation system very carefully. Um, I make sure that they're meeting contractual um, obligations. Um, for example, in our contract, all teacher, new teachers need to be have their first piece of um, feedback by number, November 15th, and I monitor that across the district. Um, that they're providing each teacher with the required number. They can do more, and I would love them to do more, but uh, for sure meeting the minimum requirements. Um, so all the technical aspects of meeting um, the contractual obligations, but more importantly, um, I do lots of coaching with principals and evaluators because principals are not the only evaluators um, in, in our schools, uh, system principals, um, our team chairs evaluate, I, I'm not sure if that's the case here, um, and, um, and others. We have some supervisor level um, positions that also evaluate. Um, and I work with them really carefully to show, <clears throat> provide models of what an effective piece of feedback looks like. <clears throat> We've done lots of work with, uh, with leverage leadership um, and um, drawing from um, that, um, you know, and sort of constructing, um, as I said, models of effective feedback and, and sharing and coaching folks um, around um, writing quality focused high leverage you know we can talk about lots of different things when we go into a classroom i think we need to narrow the focus and go after the things that matter um, and are going to be high impact um, for kids all right thank you mrs carboni okay the home stretch for real hey, is this really so thank you for spending time with us and discussing your professional experience and your approaches to educational leadership we appreciate you being here with us today to um, here. at this time do you have any questions for us and would you like to leave us with any closing statement all right, I did write some questions for lots of different people. I didn't get to use them today very much, but um, since I have them in front of me. Um, so, um, gosh, do I have a time limit? Yeah, yeah a couple minutes. Depends on right? what time you want to go all right, to what's my What's the biggest question here? What's and They're all important, but I guess I'll go back to the one that I think you asked um, uh, Ms. Silverstein about, um, you know, governance and the interaction between um, the superintendent and the school committee. And, you know, I know the work of school committee as a governing body is really complex um, and, and intricate. And so what is your philosophy of governance and what kind of relationship um, with the superintendent works best? Okay. Is that directly to no. me or to the whole anybody. group? Anybody. Anybody. I'll defer to my colleagues first. Anybody want to start? Mrs. Abel. Sure. Let's see if I can frame this. Um, so obviously I was looking for an opportunity to serve my community and to demonstrate to my kids that we all have a role to play. And uh, I sort of stumbled through a couple conservation commission meetings and decided that wasn't for me. <laughs> um, and then found this opportunity to be on the school committee. Um, I obviously have two children in the district, we're a consumer of the product. And I think that being in the elementary schools every single day as a new school committee member, I um, struggled a little bit with seeing all the nitty day to day and trying to figure out how that could inform some of my decision making or priorities that we, we bring to the superintendent through our subcommittee meetings um, on facility and finance um, and, uh, and policy. Um, so I think that I've enjoyed the learning curve with having Dr. Hershey as a mentor um, 
through that and I, I think that as we serve in this committee it's a learning process for both the superintendent and the school committee members and I think we have to appreciate the different perspectives the different roles that we have mm -hmm. and as you had said in one of your responses just being transparent and honest mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. figuring out what that line is of what we need to know and what we think we need to share back up through the administration mm -hmm. so it's it's about balance and honesty transparency Great. Mrs. Ferretti. I think just, um, and you've touched on this, timely communication. Um, that's something that I've appreciated greatly with the current relationship we have. It's, you know, it's never fun to hear from a concerned parent about something that you say, what, huh? <laughs> um, so it's just, it's nice to have that open communication in, in a timely manner so that we do have kind of the headway when something happens in one of the schools or with one of the buses and just so that we're kept in the loop and that is happening and, and that's great. And that would be great if it continued to happen with the next superintendent. Anyone else? Mr. Goodwin. Thank you. I think um, consistency is also a big part of it. Um, so with Dr. Hershey, we get our Friday updates. If anything big is going on, we get an email. Mm -hmm. um, being my second term, kind of like Mrs. Abel was saying as well, um, kind of weeding your way through everything, trying to learn the process. We all have jobs during the day, and it's hard to kind of maintain the flow of information that's just transversing through Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And so um, however it pans out um, with the new leadership, um, just knowing the consistency and the format and having something that we all can kind of agree on, like you kind of had mentioned earlier, um, so we know when and how to expect that information to come across. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Vesnick. Thank you, Madam President. I think for, uh, for me, I hope that um, we have a true educational leader. Um, so part of what I do for a living is related to education, but not with children. Mm -hmm. And so I would hope that, um, as Mr. Goodwin says, after I spend all day at my day job, um, if I come here and I have to make a vote, I have to decide on something that I have been informed um, mm -hmm. to the best of some, to the best of the ability of someone whose job it really is. So it's not necessarily my job to set, uh, you know, what what curriculum we're going to use uh, for second grade reading, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to be able to trust that the person who said we should vote for this mm -hmm. is, is um, you know, advising us uh, that that's really the way we should vote and why. Um, so for all the times this evening that you said you want data informed decisions, I think that as a body we feel very strongly the same way. I certainly do um, want to be able to have that data um, from my educational leader. Great. Mayor Cahill? I'll, I'll go after Mr. Um, oh, I didn't see yeah. you there. Oh, that's okay. So I, um, I would say one of the things that I appreciated about working with um, Dr. Hershey and I was with the new superintendent as well is to be an advocate for their staff. So when it comes time to um, mm -hmm. make the budget or contract negotiations, to help us have a better understanding of the type of work that goes on that we don't that we don't know, um, and to help us provide um, a budget and uh, a working environment for all the wonderful people that work in the district. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, hmm. I think a lot of what you said in your answer to the earlier question that's on on topic is really on point, um, and so. Um, I think as, as you, in your current position and as you see it, I mean, that's some of what we're looking for. I think that's echoed in what, what people are saying. Um, there's a, it, it's easier for me because this is my day job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but the opportunities for school committee to go into the schools, which are harder to, to, you know, to pull off, but I know that there was a, there was a learning walk done last school year, mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, putting, putting further attention on that is a good thing. Uh, some of what's going on would be you know, curricular, 
curricularly, <laughs> with curriculum and what's going on in, in other ways within the schools, I think is is being well shared at the at the subcommittee level and occasionally at the at the uh, full committee level. So so that's an opportunity, um, and I think that's it's something to keep a focus on because we, um, as as Mrs. Visnick said, we need to rely on you know, our educational experts, uh, and we all want to exercise our own due diligence to make sure that we understand all we can understand mm -hmm. um, when we're um, tasked with making decisions to hopefully in every instance benefit the kids and the, and, uh, and their educational experience and opportunities. So I could echo everything that everybody has <laughs> said, and I do appreciate your answer to this question as well. Um, I look at our relationship as something that, you know, yes, we are a governing body for the city and our constituents, and I look at our constituency as, you know, students, parents, um, staff, teachers, like everybody, and for me, it's not just within Ward 3, because for me, Ward 3 includes the middle school and the high school, so I feel like I have every student in, this, in the district um, and their families and guardians and so forth. But I, I look at the relationship as um, being, being there to support the administration, because you know I don't propose to know a whole lot about education. I mean, I've been a, a teacher of adults all my, all my adult life, but um, it is far different. And um, I've found myself inspired by, by our teaching staff when they come and share at our curriculum meetings. So you said something about presentations. That's something I look forward to because that helps me to understand um, what current teachers need. I mean, you know, look at, I, I went to school 100 years ago, so that's very different than, you know, what's happening in today's classroom. And I, I, I hope to keep being reminded of that so that um, I'm not making decisions that are based on just my own experience. So one of the other ways we did that is with learning walks and um, we were able to actually do what you did today, you know, go through classrooms and see how, uh, how differentiated learning is happening, see how technology is happening. Mm -hmm. So that when we're making a decision for this school about, you know, one-to-one -one laptops or Chromebooks or, you know, um, iPads, however we're doing that, um, we know better because of what you've given us. So I see it as a symbiotic relationship where, you know, we learn from you and, um, you know, I also see us as being sort of um, in a position to challenge things too. And, but when we challenge things to also be reminded um, that there's a lot to learn for all of us and this field of education is just vast. And I said it the other night as well, I don't know how superintendents do it every day. Um, <coughs> But you know, to keep us informed so that as we develop and tweak policy and as we build budget that we're working together to do that and honest and open and all of that stuff. So thank Great. you. Thank you for posing that question yeah, to us. That was good. Yeah, and I have others, but I know our, our time is up. So I'll just finish by saying um, thank you so much for having me here um and for constructing such a, a thorough process um i um i'm not gonna lie i had some nerves about you know the the nights before you know both both engagements but i do think that the process really allowed candidates to tell their stories and i hope my story is one that that resonates um with you all um i really tried to present my authentic self um i said you know, before I came here, I'm not going to try to be someone I'm not. I'm not going to try to espouse values that aren't mine. I'm not going to try. I said I did something that I didn't do. Um, I'm going to present who I am in an authentic and real way. And if you think I have the right skill set to to join your team, then you know, I would be thrilled um, about that. Um, but you'll be making a decision based on who Kate Carboni really is as a person and as a leader. Um, I really want to, you know, uh, commend the school committee for the ambitious course that you've laid out for um, the school district. Um, you know, there's a sense of excitement that I, um, you know, connected to in the narrative of, of the stories that, that I, I heard today. Um, 
you know, I do think there, um, you know, are opportunities too um, to 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 work um, maybe more efficiently and. Um, you know, um, and I think there are things, you know, as much as this building is amazing, it's kind of like um, some of what I heard today is the teachers are still trying to f like grow into the building in a sense, like there's so much opportunity here. Um, and they're coming from, you know, a place where there wasn't that opportunity and to, you know, there's still some growing pains. Um, it's kind of like opening a no, new school to so many different routines and, um, and so forth that they had to, um, you know, adjust to. Um, so um, I think there's, you know, um, great um, potential in the district. You know, I, I've said things like I wouldn't be here if I didn't think I was ready, and I wouldn't. I'm happy in, in Salem. I'm doing good work. I, um, I've, i you know, built a strong team. Um, I think I'm well respected in the district, um, and um, I could certainly, you know, continue to work there and, um, you know, stay fully engaged in the work. But I'm ready for a new challenge in my career. I've been very thoughtful. I think if you look at my resume, you'll see I haven't made uh, careless decisions in my, um, in my career. I've been very thoughtful. Um, I've stayed in positions for long periods of time. Um, and um, I commit fully. And I'm looking for a district that um, is student-centered, is forward-thinking, um, and has a real desire for excellence. And I think Beverly checks all those boxes for me. Um, and so I feel a real f good fit from my perspective. Um, and so I, I I am also um, feel a great connection to your vision and feel it is a vision that I can embrace. Um, I could drive forward to results um, and I could move forward. Um, and, you know, I'm a leader that knows how to leverage teams, build teams, empower teams. Um, create, um, you know, a collaborative learning culture. I know how to mobilize resources to support those teams. I know how to motivate them to work hard and smart. Um, and um, I know how to communicate. I think I'm a good communicator verbally. I'm, I, I, I like to write and I'm a good writer. Um, and um, you know, try my very best in my current position to celebrate successes. I've, I think I said earlier, that's what motivates people. They need a pat on the back to say, yes, I can do this. They need an inspirational leader um, who can inspire and commend um, the good work that is underway, celebrate it, put it on a pedestal for the community to see um, and to, to embrace. Um, so I, I think I bring and and you know and to, to celebrate I think that's so so important. Um, so I, I think I bring a skill set that I feel is well matched um, to your vision and to where the district is now. Um, and you know, as a professional and and personally, I would be um, honored, you know, to to join the team to to drive forward um, to the future. So. I'll stop there and just say thank you again. Um, it's been an honor and a privilege to even go through this process. It's been very rigorous. Um, I feel sort of a, an accomplishment <laughs> making it, um, it, it through. And um, I, I thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, just for everybody sitting here, uh, because this is our last um, finalist interview this evening, we are going to take a recess, but then when we come back, we're going to discuss some next steps for the committee. It's a still an open meeting, so people are invited to stay if you want. BevCam will not be taping it. Um, we'll engage in some discussion with our consultant, Mr. Brackett, and mostly we're going to decide on whether or not we want to do site visits to the candidates, all the candidates' districts or some of them, and, and that will determine whether we deliberate our decision 
a week from today, uh, sorry, next Wednesday the 20th or the following Wednesday the 27th. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. And I would like to entertain a motion for a brief recess, 10 minutes. Thank you, Mrs. Second. Thank you, Mrs. Freddie. All in favor? Thank you.